Welcome to today's Fragmentarium video conference. I am your host, William Duba, project manager of Fragmentarium. It's great to see so many of you here today. And as with previous conferences, I will invite you to pose questions in the chat and I will read them after the presentation. Today, it is my honor to present Dr. David Rundle, lecturer in Latin and paleography at the Center for Medieval and Early Modern Studies at the University of Kent. Dr. Rundle will be speaking on meal care and the tradition of studying fragments in the UK. Dr. Rundle. Thank you very much, Bill, and thank you for this invitation. It's a delight to be with you. Uh, and Bill, congratulations also on your pronunciation of uh, meal care. Um, uh, over, the, over the ages, uh, the memories of how to pronounce the name of, uh, have declined, but I am told that that's how we should pronounce it. Um, thank you, as I said, for the invitation and also an apology. Uh, sorry for giving you such a boring title. Uh, obviously, this is exactly what I'm going to be talking about, but I could have done something to make it a more interesting. So I have added a subtitle to this. So what? Now, I think that's probably a watchword for all of us who are interested in fragments. We know that fragments feed our ruin lust in miniature that they provide a sense of what was, what is lost. As Vian said, où sont les neiges d'antan, où sont les manuscrits d'antan? They are our snowflakes, these fragments. We also know the delight in the jigsaw puzzle, the putting back together of the various different elements. But what then, what next? I'm sure all of us, I know Fragmentarium as a project does, and I'm sure all of us as individuals have answers to the question of so what? What's the point of fragment studies? My purpose today is to give a sense of what I think one of the founders, people I see as a founder of fragment studies, thought of the so what question, and to add in some comments on that those thoughts of Neil Kerr himself. So to start, let me introduce to you Neil Ripley Kerr, who spent most of his academic career in Oxford. He was a fellow on the left-hand side here. You see the photograph in the fellow's album of his College of Magdalen in Oxford. The image on the right perhaps is better known to uh, some of you because it's the picture which was used at the yeah, front of the collection of, of essays edited by Andrew Watson after his untimely death. Yes, he was in his 70s, but he still had many years to go uh, and he died following a fruit picking accident. Uh, that tells us something about the dangers of picking fruit. Uh, Kerr was uh, a schoolboy at uh, a school in England called Eton. And during uh, that time, I'm not sure whether there's a sign of how much he enjoyed his school days or how much he didn't. He spent time in the nearby graveyard of Upton Come Chapley. And he, there is the start of his publishing career. He published as a schoolboy on the inscriptions in uh, that graveyard. Of course, there is a grand tradition of paleographers who are Eton schoolboys publishing while they're at school. M.R. James did so, and as you might remember, M.R. James produced his catalogue of the manuscripts of Eton while he was a schoolboy. We might have wished that he'd waited or indeed left it to Neil Kerr to do later. And indeed, later in his life, Neil Kerr did return to that in one of the big projects. It's very hard in manuscript studies of a whole range of types to avoid Kerr's name because it's connected to so many significant projects. One of these is medieval manuscripts in British libraries, which came out in four volumes, the last completed after Kerr's death, but with most of that, uh, the work his, and then there was a uh, a, yeah, a further index volume overseen by Andrew Watson, who was Kerr's literary executor. Um, and in the volume uh, two, 
um, uh, Eton College appears and Kerr gives his notes there. And interestingly also shows a great interest in manuscript fragments in the manuscript bindings, bindings of manuscripts in the collection of the college. But it's not just that which is the reason why Neil Kerr is remembered. It's also, for example, because of medieval libraries of Great Britain. As is said on this screen, it was first published in 1941 and then revised and augmented in 1964 um, and now has an online presence. It must be said that Kerr did not work on this on his own and it was not originated by him, but he was one of those who pushed it forward. Uh, perhaps actually one of the relevant biographical details is that during the Second World War, he was a conscientious objector. And so he worked as an orderly in uh, the John Rackham Hospital in Oxford, but he was always based in Oxford. And of course that allowed extra time for him to be working on uh, projects uh, like this, published in its first edition during the war. As well as that, we might think of his work on a uh, catalog of manuscripts, including uh, what was called then Anglo-Saxon, or, and the reason I'm talking to you today is around this volume, first published in 1954. The title there is not the full title. It is Fragments of Medieval Manuscripts used as paste downs in Oxford bindings with a survey of Oxford bindings circa 1515 to 1620. One of the early reviewers of the volume, um, one of Kerr's colleagues at Morden, called it a wonderfully frumpy title. I've never thought of Kerr as a frump, but it is the case that this is not a book which tries to sell itself. And indeed, part of what I'm going to talk to you today about is actually how deep the riches are with this book that we haven't really fully understood what we can get from it. Now, in producing this work, um, I should first of all um, point out, and this is from the online edition, okay, which has gone live today, and I'll talk about that just in a second, but I want to point out in Kerr's own introduction in the very first paragraph, he describes the types of fragments which can be used in bindings. Paste downs, wrappers, fly leaves, reinforcing strips, pasteboard pads, another word, pieces of parchment pressed together uh, to form uh, elements of or the whole of the pasteboard rather than the wooden board of a binding. It's important for us to remember that Kerr's interest is specifically in the paste down. That is the piece of material which is pasted down to the inside of a board in a binding. And as he explains in the 16th century, this was a habit used by uh, several uh, binders in a range of locations, but for the longest period uh, into the early 17th century, it was used in Oxford. It's important for us to remember that he's interested in paste downs. He's not interested in the same way in fly leaves. Those are the ones which uh, fly because they are not stuck down. Like we call them fly leaves rather than flappers. Um, and he's not interested in the more exiguous evidence which could be provided by reinforcing strips. He's interested in one element of manuscript fragment, the paster. His interest in that was possible and inspired by two related, or no, two simultaneous developments. One of those was the interest in collecting fragments. Now there is a so, very long history uh, of this. Um, and this is a good example taken from a manuscript now in the Bodleian, in the oversized Rawlinson uh, collection, where Rawlinson himself was collecting fragments, often fly leaves and paste downs from earlier books, but he was basing his work on uh, Peter Leneve's 
earlier collection, plus elements that were given to him by Thomas Hearn. And so there is a collect collecting going on at the very beginning of the 18th century. We might also want to add in Bagford, though in the case of Bagford, uh, the issue there is that it's sometimes suggested that he actually cut up the books, create uh, the fragment. In Oxford, there was a particular tradition of interest in fragments shown by taking them out from their um, the printed book or manuscript in which they sat and putting them into a guard book. The very first of those was at Queen's College Bayed in the early or mid uh, 19th century. But then there was a craze for the production of fragment uh, guard books in the you know, late, very late 19th century and the first decades of the 20th century. And these this is an example of a collection of five made in Magdalen uh, in the uh, 1910s and 1920s. Kerr himself says in his introduction that he would prefer that this had not been done, that the better way of doing this is to keep uh, them in situ, which of course is also better for the, the bindings uh, rather than taking them uh, out of, uh, from that setting. But these have come into being and they therefore are the basis for the study. The issue for care and for all of us is sometimes making sure we can work out from which book these were taken. Because in some places, there is not full information provided about the printed book or the previous binding in which these were held. I've stressed the importance of bindings. And the other thing I should say about Kerr's work is that it was based on a uh, development in the understanding of binding practices in the late 15th and uh, uh, 16th centuries with scholars like Strickland Gibson and J.B. Oldham developing a knowledge of the tools used on blind stamped bindings so that they could be localized and indeed individuated in terms of the date range in which uh, they were used. Kerr himself works from that and actually develops that further in his work. And we'll talk a bit more about that later. Kerr's work, it should be said, is not simply based in his college or in Oxford. This is a map demonstrating the range of places he visited over, I, it must be a couple of decades, in collecting the information which went into the 1954 volume. The concentration is Oxford, Cambridge, London, but as you'll see, he's traveling widely across England and into Scotland where he is of Scottish birth and he had a house in Pitlockry. So there's an explanation uh, for that. But my sense is that while he's also thinking about his other projects uh, like the Register of Parochial Libraries and Medieval Manuscripts in British Libraries, he's also keen to see the manuscript fragments um, or to see any Oxford bindings to check whether they have any paste stamps within them. This is a man with an impressive work ethic. Work ethic which shames some of us. It's also one which didn't stop in 1954. He continued collecting information about relevant bindings we all know that we publish something and then afterwards we find the one that we wanted to include. Uh, and uh, this is the case with care, because also notice here, there's nothing outside the British Isles. It's only after 1954 uh, that he goes to the States, to the Huntington and sees some uh, relevant bindings there, for instance. And in the following years, he made extra notes 
writing them up in his own copy of the volume and taking with him wherever he went a pencil and tracing paper so he could record the various, in this case, uh, the, the panels uh, of a binding and uh, on that basis place them within his order. Now, those additions and his notes now live all in the Bodleian. And it's on the basis of those notes that David Pearson in 2000 was able to produce a supplement to the uh, to Kerr's listing. These notes and indeed David's own work as well. And in addition to that, in 2004, Oxford Bibliographical Society decided to reprint the original 1954 volume. And for that, I went through Kerr's notes and those of Richard Hunt and other notes and checked some of those listed so we could add to that a uh, supplement of corrigenda and addenda. And so what we might think of as care all lives in one place. So in several places, but now it lives in one place because St. George's Day celebrated, if there are any Georgians or Portuguese or Ethiopians, happy St. George's Day to, to you. Um, it is also a day to celebrate the fact that there is now an online database of CARES pay stamps. I do not intend actually to discuss how the database works and to walk you through it. I'm happy to chat to anybody yet after the talk. I want more to think through the implications of this. But one thing I should stress is that this online edition has a double rationale. One is that it makes it easier to search and investigate, interrogate CARES pace downs with its supplements. It's a book which uh, some of the reviewers, and I remember something saying to me, it's a book where you need too many fingers and thumbs to be able to find the right place because there are so many indices and it is necessarily a complex way of ordering material. Perhaps because of that comes the second point, that, as I said at the beginning, I'm not sure that we fully appreciated the, uh, the range and importance of the implications of it. Neil Kerr's work, supplemented and developed further by David Pearson in the understanding of the practices of Oxford bookbinding, mean that we cannot simply say this book was being dismantled in Oxford, but we can say approximately or sometimes pinpoint when that was happening in that university town. And so the history of the dismantling of medieval manuscript culture is one which is enlightened by this material. In many catalogues now, it's great that we now have listings of fragments. But sometimes when that's done, a reference is made to Kerr's paste downs with the number, but not with the information that this implies or this demonstrates that this was dismantled at a particular point. My sense is that when we catalogue, we, we think of the book from its creation and then its life, afterlife of that creation. What I'm suggesting is that we actually need to think back from its present existence through its stages back to when it had been in its prime, as it were. I'm going to come back to the, some of those points at the end of this talk, but the middle section of this is going to talk a bit more about what we can expect and not expect from CARES pay stands and thus from what's available online. There are three main points to this. First of all, feast your eyes on this small volume just down the road from me in the Cathedral Archives at Canterbury with a nice centerpiece binding from Oxford of 
uh, the first decade or so of the uh, 17th century, yeah, um, centerpiece four in Care's listing, and uh, a early 14th century manuscript at the paste down at the back of this, which you can look up online with its number 1486. But this is included in Care, but what's at the front of the book is not. It's not because, as is obvious, this is print. What's interesting about this actually is if you spend some time with it, you can recognize where it comes from. It's from one of the earliest editions of Cicero's De Officiis, made in Mainz in 1466. And if you can see my cursor, the cue there is over. There is an interest then in how this incunable came to be cut up in Oxford in the first decade of the 17th century. Now, those of us who love manuscripts and who work with manuscript fragments may feel that a printed book is not truly fully a book. It is a simulacrum of a book. In the platonic forms, it's the equivalent of the three-legged table. It's not quite the ideal. We may think that, but that doesn't provide, that prejudice does not provide a rationale for how we work. And if we are to do this volume justice, we need to go beyond what was Neil Kerr's focus and think about this volume with its combination of a manuscript uh, fragment at the back paste down and print at the front. Of course, to do that requires significant extra work. It's not difficult to work out that this is part of the text of Cicero's De Officiis. To work out which edition it is, well, it's easier now. And thank God it was one of the earliest ones. Otherwise I've been going through ISTC for days trying to find the right one. Um, the point is that it actually there's a lot of work involved. So how, how will we do this in future? I don't have any answers, but I'm sure that in the answer will be collaboration. I know that there are people, and I don't know if that Alan Reynolds is with us, who are doing exciting work on print waste in early uh, modern culture. And it's for us to link up between these different perspectives to put them together so that we can respect the whole of the book. While Kerr excludes print from his discussion nearly completely, there is another element which isn't flagged up in the title paste downs, and that is the tradition of wrappers. Now, obviously, there are no binding tools here. This is the binding. But the reason though he doesn't state it explicitly, but the obvious reason for Kerr's inclusion of uh, uh, these in his uh, listings, or rather as an, an extra part to his listings, is that they cover business books of Oxford colleges for particular years. And so you can localize and indeed date their inclusion. And so this is a wrapper from uh, Christchurch, as you can see the, the details of it, which is in CARE's listing. What's not in his listing is another one in the same series of bailiff's accounts from Christchurch. As you can see, this is documentary and it's signed here by T. Cardinal of York, in other words, Thomas Woolsey. This is a grant to Woolsey's foundation of Cardinal College in Oxford. Cardinal College was founded in 1525 uh, and to found it, uh, the, uh, the Priory of St. Fideswides was dissolved and its lands, it was built, the college was built on its site after uh, Woolsey's fall, 
the college closes for a while, it's reopened and eventually becomes Christchurch. In other words, the administrators of Christchurch in the mid 16th century have access to previous documentary materials on site and are reusing those. Now, if they're doing that with this, that raises questions about the other ones, the one which we just looked at. Are these being sent off to binders and they get the leaves there? Or as with this case, are they found locally? And are they something which comes from the previous priory which preceded Cardinal College St. Friedman? Before I move on, I should add another point. Why didn't Care include this? And indeed, why didn't David Pearson? Because the uh, cutoff date that uh, Care provided for inclusion was the year 1500. Anything which is 16th century is not included in his listings. It's an interesting cutoff point, and he doesn't explain it. Uh, because elsewhere he would have used the uh, circa 1540 uh, because uh, of the dissolution of, of the monasteries. It may be that uh, 1500 is around the starting point of his discussion of, uh, of bindings. Uh, a few of the bindings uh, come from the 1490s, but nearly all of them come from the 16th century or the first two decades of the 17th century. But a caveat to lector, warning to readers, remember that anything post 1500 is not there in his listings. There is another point which I should make, which isn't an absence from care, or rather it is implicit in what he says. He is only interested in paste downs used in bindings in Oxford in the 16th and early 17th century. He says in his introduction that he's interested in that because the history of those, that usage is longer than elsewhere. It stops in Cambridge, he says, about circa 1570, but it continues up to circa 1620 in Oxford. What he does not say and what he does not imply is that there is no other use of fragments. There are fragments in Cambridge bindings after 1570. They are simply not paste downs. Similarly, with wrappers, the tradition of wrappers continues in other places, not just in Oxford. And so let me give you another example from Canterbury. This sermon gadding book, a collection of uh, notes on sermons which the uh, author has heard. Early 17th century, in this remarkable wrapper. If you'd like to see it in a less stained state, that's the inside at the front. Now, this is being used in possibly the first, probably the second decade of the 17th century, possibly produced in Cambridge or maybe in Kent, far from Oxford. We could give other examples. The history of the use of the creation of paste downs of manuscript, frag from manuscript fragments is one part of this history. But so what? Let's go back to that. And in the final section of my talk, I want to go back to what Neil Kerr himself said. This is another section from his introduction. And what we're particularly interested in is the start of the second paragraph here. And the start of the fourth line of that paragraph. There is great virtue in numbers. What he's talking about is the process of understanding how binders 
used medieval manuscripts in their workshops in Oxford across the 16th century. What he's actually saying is that there is a um, value in what we would call big data. Kerr himself is providing that with the listing of about 2,200 fragments, which now with um, the added um, uh, supplements and a re an addition of the information that he provides in his footnotes has gone up to about 2,900. From that, Kerr thought, rightly, we can start to think about the stages of the process of destruction. And this is what really interests me in this. Now, of course, there's an interest when we can reconstruct individual manuscripts, which indeed is something that Kerr has also talked about in his introduction. But how the manuscripts stopped being used and when they were dismantled is a very significant element in developing our understanding of, as it were, the end of medieval manuscript culture and their post-medieval lives, if there's any truth in that distinction. And so what I'm going to do now is provide for you some very, very, very provisional numbers. These are based on the fact that in producing the online database, we provided each entry with a fragment with a uh, subject field. And so we can arrange the information into a set uh, of subjects. And that then can be divided by, at this stage, by CARE's basic division between um, the first half century or so and the second half century. Changes in um, binding types from around circa 1570. That's why there is that's that's why the dividing point is is there. And these you know, they're very provisional because of course there can always be some movement in where you place a uh, some of these items uh, and um, that you could have a more granular approach to it. But let's stick with this for the moment. If you see, highlighted in gold here, the majority, just over half from 1515 to 1570, are biblical, liturgical, or theological. After that 1570, that increases further. And indeed, that would add further to it if we include hagiography, for example. So note that process of dismantling these types of manuscripts, which one would have thought would have become obsolete through Reformation changes in the 1530s or the 1540s, or by the end of the 1550s, increases in number and in proportion of the overall ones of those surviving after 1570. This says something about a time lag in the process of destruction and perhaps even the, the model of manuscripts which were there in a binding shop. Let me also add to this in light green there, notice the canon law and civil law, a significant over fifth in the period 1515 to 1570, but declines to a tenth in the later period. Now, 
what I also want to do, and I must, I've given a health warning for these figures, for the next set of figures, I must give an even bigger health warning. Uh, so we're gonna keep that, this, the left-hand columns here, but we'll change these to the very early blind stamped bindings of 1480 to 1515. The reason why the percentages here are problematic is, as you can see, because we've only got 82 of these. But notice the change. There is over a quarter, which come from liturgical and theological manuscripts, but only one, which is biblical. That balance in itself might be interesting, but it is more the canon law and the civil law, which is disappearing or being dismantled nearly 40%. Kern does uh, discuss this um, uh, briefly uh, in terms of the you know, law uh, uh, books, saying that it's probably an impact of print that you've got the new printed edition, and so you don't need that old manuscript. And so in the very early stages, these are being thrown out. You should also remember that in this pre-Reformation period, liturgical, the theological can also be seen as out of date and can be removed. The sharp increase in the middle century does not start from nothing. But I should also add a further caveat to this, in that in this section of this small number of 82, we have three binders. One of those is the so-called dragon binder, Thomas Bedford. And all but one of the liturgical manuscripts were used in his bindery. The second one is, is, um, the, the, is George Chastling, who dies in 1513, uh, this, uh, was once called the Fruit and Flower Binder, who provides the majority of the law fragments. And 72% of them are from him. And so there is a substantial differentiation between individual binders. Now that raises, I think, an issue. We need to look at the macro. We need to think about the big data, but we also have to remember the big data is made up of all these small elements, is made up of so many different human beings with these manuscripts in front of them deciding what to do. And that takes me to my final example, which comes from Christchurch in Oxford and the Old Street collection. Now, we know that in the vast majority of cases, or rather our assumption should be that a binder oversupplied with parchment and indeed with uh, print paper as waste is unthinking in what they use within their binding. Or rather, they think primarily about what works in terms of technology, in terms of size, in terms of being the most suitable strengthening for that binding. But then, and I'm suggesting in this case, there may be exceptions to that, where the individual is thoughtful about relating the book, printed book, its text, with what they're using within the binding. So in this case, the book is a Latin set of hymns for the serum use produced in 1555. In other words, this is a symptom of the Marian Counter Reformation. And if we looked inside it, we would see that uh, most of the pages have uh, musical notation. 
but so do the fly leaves in this manuscript. It's hard to imagine that the binder when doing this could not have been aware of what was going on. And of course, we can date this to a very tight period. Actually, there's the roll looks as if this is the very last time it's, uh, it's used until it's reused at the end of the century. But it could only be about three or four years. But there's also a curiosity. The binder, in this case, is Garbrand Harks, who was an immigrant Fleming into Oxford. In 1550, he got into a dispute with a widow who he said had insulted his wife by calling her a heretic whore. She denied, the widow denied saying that, but did admit to saying that Harp, uh, Harks' wife was a buttermouth Fleming. Uh, the point here is that Garvin Harks himself seems to be an evangelical. Now, in the mid-1550s, you probably keep that quiet. In the mid-1550s, you probably also think business is business. If somebody wants me to bind this, I'll bind this. But in that situation, is it Harks who decides to use this gradual in relation to this book? Or is it done with consultation with the visitor to his shop? Is there a process of negotiation which is going on? And so the issue here is to think about the in intentions of the individual binders in relation to their customers, not just them on their own. Trying to think about the conversations that would have occurred around these. And the reason this matters is because behind all of what we're thinking about is the capriciousness of the huge level of loss of books in the early modern period. And these human elements are an added factor in that process of destruction, or rather of not complete destruction, of moments of saving. Now, there's much more that could be discussed here. What I hope I've done is to give you a taste of what we can do on the back of, sitting on the shoulders of that giant Neil Care and the supplement on the basis of having now a searchable version available online. Thank you for listening. Wow. Thank you very much, Dr. Rundle. Um, that was fascinating. We now have time for a few questions. As I stated at the outset, please write your questions in the chat. We already have quite a few and I will read them. Let me go ahead and bring those up. Uh, first, uh, we have uh, Marie Louisa Heckman who asks you if you'd like to estimate the number of continental fragments deposited in Oxford libraries. Thank you for that closed question, which allows me to say no. Uh, I, I, I would be interested to be able to do that. To, um, and actually, we should be able to interrogate the information for those which are identified as continental. The proportion does seem to be low and does relate to some of the obvious examples, for example, the importation of law books. Um, but I wouldn't be able to, I wouldn't want at this stage to provide an estimate, but it would be something which obviously would have a significant interest and in use. What I would say is what, if funding is available, what I'd like to do is to be able to revisit the fragments uh, which have been catalogued in outline. I care to provide uh, images of them and to be able to do more in that localization uh, and to some extent uh, dating, although care obviously was a master of, 
of the dating and that the information is there. So that's another way in which we can cut up the figures. Okay. Uh, Mark Saltwaite uh, has a reaction to your, um, um, to your, your subject yeah. divisions and ask, there's no literature at all, or is that under grammar? Um, very, very little. L well, uh, very, very little vernacular literature, though there are some examples uh, of that. And it is the case that some are, some Latin literature is put under other titles at the moment, like uh, grammar or history, um, uh, or actually some of them fall into the, the philosophy. Uh, but philosophy is generally Aristotelian text. Um, no, but remember that as this is Oxford, the proportion is, of those which would have been available is low. Now, the other thing is to remember that they're cut up in Oxford. It doesn't mean that they were created in Oxford. Uh, and it may be that they came into Oxford only a few years before uh, the, the destruction. But in a university milieu, uh, that very low proportion is perhaps not that surprising. Adrian Papahaji asks, how frequent is it to find membra disjecta from the same manuscript? What's the greatest number of fragments from the same manuscript? Is there any pattern such as age, place where the manuscript was maculated or type? Um, it is very usual to find more than one fragment from a manuscript because a bind, well, a binder is likely to use the whole manuscript or whatever of the manuscript they've got. Let's remember that sometimes these are going to be manuscripts which are thrown out because they are um, in a already dying, they're in a poor state. Um, in other cases, over the century, of course, they're getting whole manuscripts. And it's unlikely that they're throwing away, though, of course, Using and binding is only one element of what they could do, and using them as paste downs or indeed fly leaves is only one element. They could also be cutting them up for uh, thin binding strips, and that's often difficult to identify. But it's uh, the, quite a few bindings have paste downs, at, uh, two paste downs from the same manuscript, and sometimes in a set you find several. The, um, actually, if you go online and look at the introduction to Cairn's uh, uh, paste downs, he lists just over 20 manuscripts uh, with just over, uh, well, with the lowest number being 20 leaves surviving from the same uh, manuscript. The answer to your second question, or sorry, third question, the three questions there. Uh, so the first one's uh, yes. Uh, the second one is, I think in the listing that we, we have, it's 45. And the third is the pattern is to do with the customer or the moment of um, the cutting up because of a particular use. And so you can get, for example, in All Souls in Oxford or in Morden in Oxford, runs of printed books which have material from uh, the, uh, the same manuscript to use them because there was a campaign of binding at that point with that particular binder. Okay, and that leads to Alessandra Molinari's question, which is, how could you identify and locate the binders? Uh, this is uh, done through a combination of, and um, this is work which Graham Pollard, I didn't mention, is really significant in this. Uh, his article, classic article in the library on the names of some binders is part of this. Uh, but the first process is by individuating tool groups. So using the rolls, the ornaments, the panels, stamps, or centerpieces, they change over the course of the century, and seeing them as groups, therefore relating to a particular binder or a particular bindery, because, of course, a binder often has a 
apprentice, and it may, and certainly on somebody's death, it is likely that the tools get passed on. Um, and David Pearson has, in, in his work on Oxford bookbinding, has demonstrated that you can also sometimes tell the stage in the life of the binding tool because damage appears in it. And so that can help. Uh, you might have a date range for the tool, but then you can narrow that down further. The work on um, identifying the binders in relation to this, as I said, Graham Pollard's work is, uh, is crucial to this. And what happens there is it's using documentary evidence. And once again, that documentary evidence uh, is usefully gathered together in David Pearson's book. Great. Um, Marie Louisa Heckman had an observation that secularization is an interesting point in the 16th century. They have similar results in Northern Germany. The interesting issue is the process of how far we associate the, the dissolution and reformation changes, and the two are related but not the same, uh, to the losses. And that's partly why I wanted to show you some examples which are definitely before the, uh, the intervention uh, of uh, either of those elements. Um, but yes, I mean, there's, there's a lot that we could uh, discuss there. All right. And Teresa Weber has a question. Was the pace down in 16th and 17th century bindings usually a discrete entity or conjoint with the first front end leaf or final rear end leaf? The usual Oxford practice is for it to be discrete. Mm -hmm. um, now, there's an interesting issue that um, CARE's discussion is intended to be solely about pace downs, but there, and there are some cases where they, they exist as fly leaves, but that might be because they're pace downs which have been lifted rather than having originally been fly leaves. But it is uh, rare in Oxford bindings to find um, fly leaf and uh, pace down as um, uh, as a whole opening or uh, connected to, uh, as conjoint. Um, usually it is usually it is separate. Uh, and of course, we also had to add in, as I've been saying, uh, binding strips, reinforcing uh, strips is another element to this. So sometimes what you get is a paste down, which may be connected to a broad strip rather than a full. Flyleaf. Okay, we're getting through these. Uh, Philippa Sissis uh, says, thank you for the wonderful insight. Are there any reflections on the aesthetics of the used fragments, the compositional interplay between the paste downs and the next pages? Are there indicators that this was of any importance to the use of them? Thank you. Well, obviously I touched on that in the, that last example. I do think that we have to be careful. In this busy business atmosphere in a bindery, it is likely that most of the time it is a speedy process without much aesthetic selection going on. Uh, what I haven't had chance to talk about, and is a really interesting topic, is the cases where, and I can think of Cambridge cases, where binders seem to consciously choose the blank parts of leaves for use in bindings. So the aesthetic there is that they want to have the white space. There are some cases where the choice seems to be of presenting a whole leaf, rarely because it's illuminated, but it does have um, in script terms an aesthetic value, or at least we see that. The issue is how far we can get back into the, the binder's minds, as I said. And, and as I said, I think this is something we should be trying to do, but we have, I think, to start from the assumption until we can prove otherwise that they were doing it as a quick process 
um, another book to bind. Uh, where's, where's that manuscript? I'll tear out a leaf, stick it in, rather than uh, sitting back, um, probably don't have much tobacco, but uh, drinking a, a, a bit of ale, because of course they also dealt in ale, and uh, thinking carefully about which ones they're gonna choose. Okay, and we have Adam Smythe saying, thanks so much, David. Describe the sympathy between host and fragment in the Marian Alestri example. Does this uh, suggest the possibility of the opposite too? A manuscript paste down as a satirical comment on the main text? Oh yeah, absolutely. I do think that happens at times. Yes, um, I think I think in this uh, the, the the Marian case, and I, I mentioned the issue of Harks uh, as an evangelical because I do think that complicates this. But I do get the sense that if we with more work, we might be able to identify some who are consciously disrespecting the manuscript in the way that they use it as a paste down. Uh, one of the basic coordinates here, which actually Kerr doesn't record, but we try to in lost manuscripts, is uh, orientation. How far is it being placed so that it is um, the same way up as the title page, or is it inverted, or it's put it on its side? Uh, those sort of things may actually be part of the answer to, to that question, but there's a lot more research which needs to be done on that. Thank you, Adam. That's a, yeah, thank you for that question. And uh, Mark Thacker has a long shot for you. Have you found any overlap with the reports in Bale's index of manuscripts that he'd seen in various officine, et cetera, circa 1550? Great question. Um, and the answer to that is not yet, but uh, maybe what's behind uh, Mark's question there is the fact that Garb und Harks is one of the officine mentioned in Bale. There are can't remember, uh, 15 to 20 manuscripts in Bell's listing, which are in his bindery. Now that uh, suggests something. Um, uh, now it may well be that the very fact that Bell saw them, you know, so make sure you don't tear that one up. Uh, and of course, because let's remember that these people may well be selling the books as well. And so what they might be doing is taking those, I'm never gonna be able to sell that one. <laughs> so they use it in the, the binding. But no, that's a really important point. And uh, I must say that uh, I'm increasingly thinking that there's a rabbit hole to dive down in investigating uh, Harks's career. Okay, well, we're coming to the end of our hour here. We have a um, bibliographical note from Giovanni Varelli who says, thank you, David, for a fascinating talk. Just to mention that the possible connections between some music fragments and their host volumes contents ha has been explored recently by Carl Kugler in a very interesting essay, The Aesthetics of Fragments, Reading Paste Downs in Context or Late Medieval Bookbinders, Readers and Their Choices in Open Access. Yeah, yeah that's like, and thank you to uh, my friend Giovanni. It's, uh, it's great to have you there. Quickly, Christina Solidoro in Bologna, I believe, uh, asked the question about, what about the side pasted in the binding? Are they flesh sides or grain ones? Which side of the, which side of the, is there a regular way in which they paste the um, uh, parchment down? Flesh uh, a new Gregory's rule. Uh, okay. The, A really interesting question. Uh, my sense is that there is not a, uh, no, um, that uh, there isn't a, um, a basic uh, practice uh, and that it does vary. Having said that, that is something which I'd like to double check. And, and Bill, in, in the material that you have in Fragmentarium, is there anything there which could? I don't think if someone's looked at specifically at that, my impression is that there isn't a rule, but there might be. It could be, maybe even bookbinders have their own practices. Uh, yes, um, uh, my, my, uh, certainly my sense is um, that, uh, Ah, of course, because it works in two ways. Uh, aesthetically, 
flash side up makes more sense, but actually in terms of gluing, it may, and making sure it, it sticks, actually the flesh side down has advantages. Um, uh, but it's, a, 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 Christina, thank you very much for that point. It's a, it's a really uh, good one. Um, uh, I can imagine days or months having to go back through libraries and to just stroke the paste downs. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you again, Dr. Rundle. And thanks to all of you for attending this Fragmentarium video conference. Our next conference will take place on May 28th, 2021, when Dr. Jennifer Bain of Dalhousie University and Dr. Deborah Lacoste of the famous Cantus database, the Institute of Medieval Music at the University of Waterloo, will present Digital Analysis of Chant Transmission, DACT, a case study of two fragments from the binding of the Reason Codex. I look forward to welcoming you then. Thanks again.